Good evening to you all. Um, I think pretty much everyone does know that I'm Peter Jennings, the Executive Director of ASPE, but in case you haven't met me, that's who I am. And we're very pleased to welcome back Mike Pizzullo to speak to us again. Last time was about midway through 2017, Mike, so we're, um, we're agog to hear your latest thinking on uh, strategic issues. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Greg Moriarty, Secretary for Defence, who's here, but I hope everyone will forgive me if I don't acknowledge our, uh, everyone in our audience. Um, you're, you're, all, you're all important to us. So Mike was appointed as Secretary of the Department of Immigration and Border Protection in October of 2014. And prior to this, Mike was Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Customs and Border Protection Service from February 2013, and he acted earlier in the role from September of 2012. Mike first joined that service as Chief Operating Officer in July of 2009, and before that was Deputy Secretary for Strategy, in which capacity he and I worked uh, very closely together in the Department of Defence, a position to which Mike had been appointed in January of 2006. Mike joined uh, the Department of Defence as a graduate in 1987, a few years ago now, Mike, and worked there until 1992 when he transferred to the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet where he worked in the International Division. In uh, March of 1993, he joined the staff of Foreign Minister Gareth Evans and remained in Parliament House until December of 2001, which included serving five years as the Deputy Chief of Staff to the Leader of the Opposition, Kim Beasley. Between February 2008 and May 2009, Mike led the Defence White Paper team and was also principal author of the 2009 Defence White Paper. Um, how, how things change, Mike, here we are. Several white papers um, further on with yet another one being spoken about. Perhaps you can come back for the next, uh, next one. Mike has an honours degree in history from Sydney University and among his interests uh, includes being with his family, uh, cricket, rugby league, and reading anything on military history, international relations, intelligence and political biography. So Mike, it's a pleasure to have you here um, addressing us in a relatively new auditorium that I'm delighted to welcome you to. To address us on the topic of seven gathering storms, some national security in the 2020s, please welcome Mike to the podium. Uh, well, uh, thank you, uh, Peter. That introduction is pertinent because some of the points I'll be making actually relate to some of the things I've come across in that 32-year uh, period. I'll have a number of um, people in the audience that will keep me honest in that regard. I won't acknowledge everyone, but um, uh, uh, Lynn, my wife, has been with me for that whole journey, and darling, it's great to have you here tonight. So you can fact-check the historical personal references. And similarly, uh, my very dear friend, Greg Moriarty, uh, who joined a little bit earlier, about 12 months, one year earlier, and also joined the Defence Department. and. He and I got up to some hijinks in those early years, which are highly classified uh, and uh, will never, never ever be uh, broadcast at all. And to everyone else, my apologies for not acknowledging others. Uh, it's great to have dear friends and colleagues here, as well as uh, just observing through the room uh, some of our young up and, up and coming leaders. It's wonderful to have you here as well. I'm sometimes asked about future national security challenges. This evening, I should like to provide a framework for thinking about this question. I do so with 32 years of experience in the field of national security, defence and international affairs, a modest basis for claiming that I've seen enough of the past to perhaps some, to have something useful to say about the future. Tonight, I present a list of seven gathering storms, as I've entitled them, in, of the 2020s, ranked by their intrinsic importance as risks to be mitigated having regard both to their likelihood, which in a number of cases would be mercifully low, and their consequences for our economy, society, and in some cases, way of life. This is a framework for thinking about risk. It is not a list of predictions, nor is it a gratuitously drawn dark view of the world designed to frighten children, readers of this city's newspaper, or the subscribers of certain commentary blogs. Here is the list. Number one, the prospect of great power war will, in the 2020s, approach 
but not reach a level of probab probability last seen in the mid-1980s, occasioned, I must stress, not by design on the part of any great power, but by the risk of strategic miscalculation and operational misadventure as the great powers project military power around Eurasia and its maritime environs and across the Pacific, Indian and Atlantic Oceans. No rational actor ever seeks a catastrophic war and yet history tells us that such wars occur. We often then argue later, for decades if not centuries, about why they started and what it was thought might be best achieved by going to war. Secondly, the employment of chemical, biological, radiological or nuclear weapons outside of great power war and not necessarily by readily identifiable actors. As with the prospect of major war, this would be a mercifully unlikely contingency, but one which needs close attention, especially in relation to the potential use by terrorists of readily transportable but difficult to manufacture biological weapons including those which could occasion a severe pandemic or nuclear devices that could fit into a small container. Three, a cyber attack with economy-wide ramifications targeting the nation's financial, energy, water or transportation systems. Unfortunately, this contingency is more plausibly likely, notwithstanding the, the significant efforts and investments that have been undertaken by governments and the private sector in recent years. Much more needs to be done in this area. Our traditional ways of thinking about deterrence and defence simply do not map directly across to the cyber realm. The negligible imposition of costs for, for malicious conduct in the cyber domain will embolden yet more malicious conduct, which is ever ratcheting up and which will, in the 2020s, make the cyber attacks of the past decade seem like the first dogfights in the earliest days of aerial combat. Four. While the deliberate subversion of our democratic institutions and our social cohesion is an old enemy, seen in the past in political warfare and subversion, espionage and disinformation, it is now taking on new forms, especially in this highly connected age. In the 2020s, we are likely to see regular attacks on our elections, the spread of disinformation for geostrategic purposes, and deliberate attempts to fracture our social cohesion and unity. Compounding this risk is the rise of social media and what I term the digital industrial complex, whose proponents and beneficiaries have managed to seduce many with the false belief that connectivity without values enables the untainted expression of so-called popular will, free of the taint of power and manipulation, and creates a platform for a supposedly authentic expression of self. Instead, I contend, connectivity has become a new site of power, monetised for the enrichment of the self-interested proponents of its supposedly liberating qualities. Five, the security implications of the world's ungoverned and dangerous territories, which host terrorist groups, as well as insurgents who are at war with the nominal state authority of the territory that they occupy. These territories and the disputes which are fought across them will continue to generate the mass displacement of peoples, as will poverty, hunger, water and resource scarcity, and a changing climate, which will have to be thought of as a systemic risk factor. Fragile or non-existent state sovereignty and control of territory coexists with the interrelated challenges of terrorism, insurgency, and the mass movement of people who are seeking protection from violence and conflict. We treat these problems separately at our peril. Six, radical extremist Islamist terrorism, which will continue to mutate and evolve, posing risk abroad and at home. While the defeat of ISIS is to be welcomed, its ideology will fall on fertile ground elsewhere. Worryingly, Al Qaeda would strike again if it could. And of course, homegrown terror cells and lone wolves and returning foreign terrorist fighters continue to be a very high priority concern. Seven and finally, the globalisation of transnational serious and organised crime 
which in the 2020s will threaten national security and public safety in hitherto unseen ways in terms of the volume of illicit narcotics and other illicit goods crossing our border, the incidence of the trafficking and smuggling of people, the level of violent criminality that we are likely to see, the threat to our revenue base as increasingly sophisticated techniques are employed to thwart taxation and customs detection and enforcement efforts, and increasingly worrying attempts to in infiltrate our public institutions and to corrupt officials in order to create an ever more permissive environment for crime. Again, to stress, this is not a randomly generated list of scares. It is an evidence-based risk framework for thinking about national security in the 2020s and for making decisions about capabilities, strategies, plans, operations and resource allocation. Lest it be thought that this represents a sinister and cynical dark view of humanity, let me stress that I'm a strategic optimist. If threats are realistically assessed, if risks are properly appreciated and managed, if all do, do their duty, if the nation is engaged intelligently on the challenges that lie before us in a discourse which brings together parliamentarians, journalists, business leaders, academics and others, if difficult choices are taken in good time, then we will navigate these storms, ever hopeful of clear skies and calm seas. If, however, we take the path of neglect and apathy, if those so charged fail in the discharge of their duties, if the nation does not engage purposefully and in good time, then I do fear that one or more of these storms will break savagely, savagely upon an unsuspecting and unprepared populace. Were that to happen, and I refuse to believe for one moment that those of us who are charged with acting would so wantonly fail in, their, in our duty, but were that to happen, then I also fear that the calamity would be too great to bear in some circumstances and there would follow significant social and economic dislocation. I especially fear that were an unprepared Australia to be faced with dealing with an unheralded cataclysmic event, excuse me, event, one which might shake the nation to its economic, social and moral foundations, then the urge for draconian and excessive reaction might prove to be too great and to, in ways too injurious to our precious liberties. Overarming the state could be as great a danger as underpowering it. In policy, as, as in life generally, we tend to over and undercorrect at the wrong times, when we should in fact typically operate in counter cycles. All the more reason therefore to honestly and resolutely prepare for the storms ahead, avoiding them where we can and riding them out where we cannot. I should now like to take a step back and provide a personal historical perspective to these challenges. My thesis is this, we have seen and dealt with these types of challenges before. What will challenge us in the 2020s, however, will be their concurrency, their confluence and their interdependencies. The risks they occasion will have to be managed both separately and collectively, in part and in aggregate. When I joined the Department of Defence, specifically the Defence Intelligence Organisation initially in January of 1987, we were closer in time to the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 than 1987 is in fact to us today. That is, we were 25 years past the Cuban Missile Crisis, while today we have moved 32 years past that year, 1987. The focus at the time, some of you will recall, was on superpower com competition and confrontation. Indeed, my first three assignments, which Professor Dib might recall as well, uh, although I doubt it, um, I was very junior, Paul, were research tasks associated with the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, which was si signed later that year in 1987, Soviet fleet movements in Southeast Asian waters, and the prospective shape of potential US-Soviet naval confrontation in the Northern Pacific. I soon after moved into an area of defence which, which dealt with the joint facilities at Pine Gap, which is near Alice Springs in the Northern Territory, Northwest Cape, which is near Exmouth in Western Australia, and Narunga, no longer operating near Woomera in South Australia, where we did highly classified work, much of which remains classified to this day, which was concerned with strategic nuclear forces, 
space and missile activities and other very sensitive matters. Tom Clancy had just published Red Storm Rising, a novel, in 1986 and would soon see another one of his books made into a movie in 1990, The Hunt for Red October. Art was imitating life as there had been a nuclear scare in 1983, about which we now know more today due to the release of classified documents and extensive research by scholars in recent years. We now know that the Soviet leadership in that year was convinced that a NATO exercise to be held later in 1983, Able Archer 83, the name of the exercise, was a ruse, they thought, for a possible surprise first strike on the Soviet Union. They were perilous times. During this period, specifically from August 1990 to February 1991, the US and its allies fought the first Gulf War with the aim of evicting Saddam, Saddam's Iraq from Kuwait, which it had invaded in August of 1990. For the first time, the world saw an awesome display of US conventional military power and superiority, which was enabled by advanced technologies such as night fighting and stealth techniques, unrivaled intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance systems, and precision strike weapons. Now today, anyone who is aged 30 or under is likely to be vaguely aware, if at all, of that era, and perhaps through the lens of popular culture, perhaps through the movie Atomic Blonde, which came out in 2017. They might even know that the German rock ballad 99 Luftballons, 1983, by the band Nina, was about accidental nuclear war. But perhaps they don't know that if they've heard of the song at all. In any event, this perilous era vanished, it seemed, in a moment, as if it had been but a dream. From the fall of the Berlin Wall in November of 89 to the collapse of the Soviet Union in December 91, events moved with astonishing speed. The soundtrack of the decade was rounded off with another German rock ballad, Wind of Change by Scorpions, 1991, an anthem of hope and, optim and optimism after a century of tragedy. Looking back, even though we did not know it at the time, we enjoyed five minutes of strategic sunsh sunshine in the early 1990s. We enjoyed five minutes of strategic sunshine in the early 1990s. It seemed at the time as if the liberal democracies had prevailed and the spread of capitalist democracy would, would be unchecked, perhaps finally bringing the end of history into view to reference Fukuyama's famous book of 1992. There were voices of dissent, to be sure, Huntington, Miesheimer and Kaplan, excuse me, to name but three. But generally, the following format formula came to be taken for granted. Defence spending could be reduced, reduced as great power war had been forsworn, authoritarianism had been defeated and democratisation would prevail. Technology and communications, including the new technology known as the internet, would bring us closer together. Globally agreed rules would dictate behaviour and the rules-based order which had emerged out of the Second World War could finally be universalised. Russia and China would integrate relatively easily into the global trade and investment system and the world would be enmeshed ever more tightly through the spread of global supply chains, financial markets and networks of trade, investment and commerce. To continue with some personal reflections, after the fall of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, I moved to the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet in 1992 and then into the Foreign Minister's Office in 1993. In both roles, I worked on the Uruguay round of uh, world trade negotiations and the proposal, which the Australian Government championed, for there to be held an annual summit of APEC leaders, which was realised in 1993. The annual gathering of the great, good and famous at the World Economic Forum in Davos became institutionalised at this time with its particular brand of denationalised globalism put on display at the start of every calendar year. Looking back over a quarter of a century to that time, the world is so different. The sense of possibility seems to have passed. Just as the blue sky glimpsed briefly during, during the, a break in, in a storm disappears when steely grey clouds close the heavens from view. Of course, we should take stock of the positive gains from this time. Today, the global order is indeed more connected, networked and interdependent than at any point in history. There's no question about that. Poverty has been reduced. Living standards have improved. 
and technological progress has created positive opportunities in terms of saving labour, connecting people and enabling creativity. These are positive developments and not marginally so. However, it did not entirely worked out as imagined in those heady days of the early 1990s when it felt as if the world could be made anew. And risks and challenges emerged after the fall of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, which were not properly anticipated and managed. Two major developments emerged in the early 2000s, which reset the game forever, I suspect. I will not deal with them in depth, as they each warrant a separate address. First, the attacks on 11 September 2001 brought radical extremist Islamism to the fore in the most spectacular way imaginable. Starting with operations in Afghanistan, we embarked on what some have termed the long war, so-called, against extremist terrorism, which placed a premium on counterterrorism and counterinsurgency capabilities and operations. We, we became very familiar with Al-Qaeda and later ISIS, as well as domestic homegrown terror. Our militaries reorganised themselves and reacquainted themselves with irregular warfare with a consequential diminution of a focus on conventional warfare. This is a well-known part of the story for such, an, for such an audience, and I will not dwell here. At around the same time, that is the early 2000s, Russia and China started to seriously accelerate investment in their advanced conventional military capabilities, including in relation to power projection, a trend which continues to this day. In the 2020s, US military superiority will be increasingly challenged. Greater potential costs are likely to be imposed on US freedom of action. This will, in all likelihood, affect the calculus in the 2020s for how and where US, the United States employs military power around Eurasia and across the Pacific, the Indian and the Atlantic Oceans. Moreover, we did not anticipate how, over this period, Eurasia would emerge in the 21st century as an increasingly coherent and salient strategic system, 100 years after Mackinder had set out his thesis that this would happen. New patterns and networks of trade, investment, infrastructure, telecommunications, energy and migration across and around Eurasia, which will become even more pronounced as the Arctic Ocean becomes a zone of increasing importance, began in the 2000s to upend the traditional strategic advantage which had been enjoyed since the 15th century by maritime trading powers. This trend has become entrenched over the past two decades and its consequences will be increasingly felt across the board in the 2020s. Relatedly, we are seeing the deliberate use of investment, industry and research policies to create strategic advantage and technological superiority for the purposes of great power competition, which will intensify in the 2020s. Notwithstanding these trends, and I wish to emphasise this, so much so it's bolded in my text, notwithstanding these, these trends, it cannot be stressed often enough that China's rise has been the most peaceful of any great power in 500 years and all have a stake in ensuring that this remains the case. By 2006, at which time I was, by which time I was the Deputy Secretary in Defence with particular responsibility for defence strategy and force planning, these trends were very much on our minds as we dealt with the twin challenges of the so-called long war and the prospect, however slim, of great power war. Across departments and agencies, there were sincerely held and widely divergent views about the future force structure of the Australian Defence Force and whether to structure the ADF principally for low intensity operations against insurgents and terrorists or principally for maritime warfare against conventional adversaries in the defence of Australia, including against a great power adversary which might seek to attack us as part of a larger military campaign against our principal ally. Now, tonight, colleagues, is not the night to retell the story of what became the 2009 Defence White Paper, which was launched almost 10 years ago in May of 2009, and which I was honoured to author. Regrettably, its conjectures and its prescription for a heavier maritime-focused ADF, which were greeted with incredulity at the time, have proven to be altogether too prescient. 
They are now the orthodoxy in defence planning. My only regret is that I did not stick to my that I did not stick to my instincts at the time and insist that the deterioration in our strategic circumstances would occur even more quickly than the final document suggested. I just decided then not to ever make the same mistake again over the rest of my career. Since then, I've been honoured to hold roles in the Australian Customs and Border Protection Service and the Departments of Immigration and Border Protection and Home Affairs, as you heard earlier. Over this decade, I've been focused on borders and the migration of peoples, including overseeing Operation Sovereign Borders over its entire existence. The customs aspects of our links to global supply chains, and more recently in home affairs, terrorism, transnational crime, aviation and maritime security, cyber security, critical infrastructure, foreign interference, es um, espionage and disinformation, and emergency management. What I've learned over, the, over that time is this. Strategic dynamics are now cycling at a tempo to be measured in months and at most a year or so at a time, and not decades. Rapid and significant changes are occurring within parliamentary terms, and the security landscape can be transformed across one or two of those terms. The additive effect of the different threats and risks creates its own systemic complexity or to return to the central idea of this speech, we are facing the separate and combined challenges of dealing with the gathering storms, distinctly and concurrently, independently and conjointly. Earlier distinctions between home and abroad are breaking down completely as a result of advances in technology, communications and finance, the rapid move movement of data, the mass movement of people, ever-changing global supply chains, and much more besides. The duality of globalisation, that is, opportunity and prosperity on the one hand, coupled with terror and criminality in its shadows and seams on the other, is disrupting our societies for good and ill. The state's role in protecting sovereignty and protecting the citizen is being challenged and deconstructed. And how the state operates in partnership with industry international partners, new and traditional, and the populace to be protected is itself still a work in progress, especially with regards to the use of data, which avoids the, per the perils of mass surveillance of that population, and the need to strike the right balance between prosecution on the one hand and disruption on the other. We must, above all, hold fast to the supremacy of the law, without which there is only barbarism. Looking back over three decades and then casting forward to the 2020s, I can see, regrettably, a dark kaleidoscope of future stormy possibilities, which, if not, nav nav navigated, excuse me, if not navigated successfully, might come to pass at our great cost. I can see a red storm rising, although the likelihood, again, of a great power war, especially involving nuclear weapons, remains thankfully low, but it is not unthinkable. I can see terrorist use of a biological or nuclear weapon, a massive cyber attack, increasing attacks on our democratic institutions and our social cohesion by subversive means, the persistence of ungoverned and dangerous territories which generate terrorism, insurgencies and the mass movement of peoples, which will directly affect our national security, continuing attacks by adherents of radical extremist ideologies, Islamist ideologies, and criminality, which is increasingly sophisticated, organised on a global scale and difficult to attack. Now, in the face of these ill tidings, should we panic? Well, only if it helps. Otherwise, we should focus calmly and realistically on what lies ahead. We should, above all, draw on, on the strength of our traditions, our history and our values, which show us, above all else, that courage, cunning an organisation in the face of adversity will always prevail over the darkness, whether that darkness takes the form of the tyrant, the invader, the terrorist, the saboteur, or the criminal who thinks nothing of selling death to a child. If we are sure of our values, confident in our, in our abilities, certain of our arrangements and unified in our work, we will prevail, as did our forebears in other stormy times. Thank you very much. Thank you.